something that you cannot hear, but I think I can play it for you in a way that will um, make some sense. So this is a video that is coming to us again from Italy. And I'm choosing this Italian stuff that I think pretty much everybody on this call is in the United States. Um, and so I think Italy represents a bit of our future, unfortunately. So you don't need to hear it. And if you could, you probably wouldn't understand them unless you speak Italian, but I can talk you through it. Um, so what is happening here is here's a guy who is looking at the newspaper in Italy. It's the 9th of February, 2020. There's like a top story about Amazon Alexis. And he turns to the obituary page. He's in the town of Bergamo. And there's like one, one and a half pages of obituaries in this issue of the paper. Then he looks at the paper from the 13th of March and the cover story is COVID and he's got one page of obituary, two pages, three pages, four pages, five pages, six, seven, eight, nove, like, yeah, 10 pages of um, obits. And I share that not to just like shock folks, but one, I, I think it's very, oh, snap. Oh, okay. Give me one second. Got to. Just get Elizabeth some info. Okay. Okay. Got to keep the family moving. Um, let me, so yeah, I was trying to share the Italian thing because it, it kind of humanizes the effect of what's happening over there. And it's, um, I think some version of that is kind of in our future in terms of the numbers and the lag that the U.S. has had with the testing um, and just the acknowledgement of, of what's actually, and the social distancing more importantly. So yeah, that's what I wanted to share. I sort of did that poorly because I interrupted myself. Um, let me try a different segment called View From My Hood. One, because I think it'll be more fun. And then I'm gonna see who among you might wanna share some stuff since you're, this is an interactive space. And so I'd love to hear what you're seeing. Um, so let me just do the trick one more time. Oh, you know what? Maybe I'm making this more complicated than I need to. If instead, I'm gonna go ahead and start that, do the same move, getting a little faster. Great, and then we go to, okay. So, good, we're all seeing this, I believe. And let me just make sure I can see the chat in case nothing's working. Oh, it's Bergamo, not Bergamo. Thank you, David Orban. So before I move on, I'm checking out the chat. Uh, David Orban is in, said he's in Italy right now in Bergamo and uh, cozy and locked up in my home. But yeah, people are sick and dying around here, including in my street. So David, uh, do you have the ability to turn um, Audio on, audio on. You, if so, if you're willing to chat. Hi, Burton. How are you? Hey, good. Let hey, me turn good. Up Let me turn up my volume. Oh, and I have to mute oh, myself. And I have to mute myself. All right. In fact, I'm going to close that. I'm going to close that. Yes. Okay. So, David, oh, you're muted again. No, I'm muting because I'm not using the headset. So, uh, just to exclude the uh, echo. Say that one more time. 
I am muting myself when I'm not speaking to avoid echo uh, back into the channel. Right. So if you turn down my volume um, a bit more, maybe that'll help. But let me just do this and kind of open the floor to you uh, so we don't have to go back and forth. So what I'm interested in, and I think what a lot of people might want to know is um, how long have you been in Italy? Is it your home? Are you there on vacation? Is this a business trip? Uh, so kind of how long have you been there? And just paint a picture for us of what things are like in the town. I'm going to hand you the mic. I'm going to hand you the mic. Um, yeah, so uh, I commute between New York and uh, Italy, and I have a home here uh, east of Milan, where Bergamo is. Um, if you uh, are in a restaurant in New York and you look at the, the bottle on your table, Pellegrino, that's my tap water, right? So uh, it's uh, very nice and uh, a beautiful place, except that it happens to be the second largest epicenter of the infection outside of China. And uh, uh, what people have been afraid of, of the health care system being overrun, by uh, everybody being sick is what is happening here so that uh, there are not enough uh, intensive care uh, beds and uh, whether you have the coronavirus or you have a stroke uh, there is a competition for who gets a uh, cure and uh, the, uh, the doctors have to decide if you have a good chance of surviving, then you get the uh, intensive care. If not, you're gonna die. And uh, so that is why it is so important uh, to make sure that as few people as possible get sick. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And I think for me, it, it sounds like what we've been reading is true. I had seen some stories about that what it means for the medical system to be overwhelmed. Uh, and that is it, you know, you have to start denying services to folks who you think are not gonna make it. So it sounds like a, like a war type situation, uh, which is not very good. Do you have any sense of how long you're going to be in this kind of hold pattern in terms of staying, staying in your home? In your, how, are you, how are you accessing how are services, you accessing right, services now? right now? So um, uh, the government, uh, uh, imposed uh, lockdown about uh, 10 days ago, uh, maybe a little less, and it should officially last for another 10 days, but it is practically sure that they will renew the, uh, the measures. Uh, because what you have to look at is what is called the growth ratio. So uh, whether the number of new cases today is lower than the new cases yesterday, and you have to understand that if that keeps going down, it's not that you are done. You are just halfway through because previously cases were exploding exponentially. Now cases are trending to stop, but it will still take a long time. So if the growth ratio gets small enough in another 10 days, there will be another month of full lockdown. Otherwise, there's going to be a full uh, explosion again of, of, of cases. And uh, the way you ask me, we get uh, services is that uh, uh, one person from each family can go grocery shopping and they have to actually fill in a piece of paper to show uh, to, the, to the roadblocks. There are police and military roadblocks. And if you are on the street uh, without uh, a good reason, uh, you are fined and theoretically you can be jailed. In practice, you are already jailed in your home, so it doesn't matter. But uh, it's, it's uh, al already more than 20,000 fines have been, <laughs> have been issued all over Italy because of people uh, going around that they, they shouldn't. But in this area, things are serious enough so that uh, we were on my terrace um, after lunch and we were telling each other that everything was completely silent 
no cars, no children playing. Uh, you could hear the birds chirping and from time to time a siren uh, uh, more, more or less distant. So it's, it's definitely eerie, the contrast between uh, nature and the mountains and the beautiful Italian landscape and the fact that you know that everybody's holed up in their homes and, and uh, they are rightly afraid as well as prohibited from leaving. Yo, um, all right, thank you. Thank you for sharing all that. I think it's, there's a juxtaposition of like what you're describing, which first of all mirrors exactly what we're seeing in press reports and Instagram and Twitter. Uh, and so I'm just, I guess I'm glad to know that this is real, but I'm sad to know that this is real. Um, and, it's, and it sounds very eerie. Um, and I think for those of us who are kind of behind the curve, kind of in a wave that's yet to land, Sort of hoping it doesn't land here as hard, but quantitatively expecting that it will um, is, is what I'm yeah, I, 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 I think if I may, Bertunde, that realism please, is please. more important than hope. Uh, the yeah. U.S. Yeah. runs the risk of being hit even harder because of the delay of the measures. The fact that schools are not being closed, the fact that people who should stay home don't stay because they are afraid of losing their jobs so they go to work even if they are sick is a premise for infections that are going to explode exactly because there is a delay of one or two weeks after getting the virus and manifesting the symptoms and and every day that extreme measures are imposed uh, increases the number of sick people who are running the risk of dying. And the difference of the um, fatality rate uh, between what is in uh, South Korea, for example, and what uh, we are seeing in, in Italy, and what is going to be in the US is how quickly the measures have been put in place. So hoping is not going to make it. Everybody individually should self-impose the measures. If the government is not smart enough to, to, to tell people what they should do, the smart people should do it by themselves. Don't mix up with others. Don't go to the restaurants. Don't go to the pubs. Don't go to concerts. 500 people or more is ridiculous. Five people or more shouldn't happen. Cool. Uh, that's great. Sorry, I am. Uh, I'm hearing you, and I'm also updating the uh, resources in the Google Doc. So let me just uh, switch gears. This is what happens when you go live. Uh, thank you, David. I don't, uh, you know, have anything else I want to ask of you at this moment. If there are people in the chat, you know, who have logged in, first of all, if you've just joined, welcome. This is live on lockdown, a test show with Baritum Day Thurston, uh, episode triple zero. And uh, who I've invited into the audience slash participation to the community, I guess, uh, are the people from my Patreon and the people who let me into their phones on a regular basis through the community text thing. We have just heard from David Orban, who is in Bergamo, Italy, uh, where he has been 10 days on lockdown expecting another 10 and anticipates things might go beyond. And you know, the curve that he's on, gonna improvise here, we're going mobile. So, uh, you know, we got like time and we got this sort of caseload and it sounds like, you know, we're hoping that he's kind of flattening out where he's at. Um, the U.S. is probably down here somewhere, and you still have all this time to tend to, even as you're coming up the backside of that curve in terms of caseload and the medical, the economic, and the social impact of what that does to a society. Um, and again, if you're just joining, I'm trying to recap, also making sure I heard correctly. Uh, but what David in in Bergamo is saying as well is you know, the U.S. might actually get hit harder uh, because we have not taken the aggressive measures. You know, Italy did quarantine the Lombardy region in the north first, 
Um, I think that was a week ago. We haven't done any such thing. We, the, I think the town of New Rochelle was put on lockdown by Governor Cuomo in New York. Governor Inslee in Washington has been dealing with probably the largest US city to take aggressive action in Seattle. Uh, Governor Newsom here in California. I'm coming from Los Angeles, for those who don't know. Uh, you know, the schools in LA are closed. That's not a notorial decision, that's our mayor. But he is a, the governor's advised that bars closed. I know Nike's closed, Apple's closed. And my own experience uh, being the one member of my household to go out to get supplies is that uh, the grocery stores are being hit pretty hard. Uh, there's no kale at Whole Foods. That's, that's, that's real, that's real. Maybe it's the toilet paper that people are using the kale for. So on a, on, a, on a most serious public health, public service announcement note, stay home. Uh, if you are able to, if you go out, minimize it, keep your distance if you must, and um, be prepared mentally. And I think David is echoing something that Dr. Michael Osterholm said on Joe Rogan now last Wednesday, feels like three years ago, um, which is, you know, give people the information that they need so they are expecting what really can happen. And when it does, they won't feel like we've been lying to them. And if it doesn't, it's because they've taken measures to try to prevent those worst cases. Uh, so yeah, thank you again, David. That was my kind of recap of our time together. I'm just gonna glance at the chat uh, real quick. Um, so, okay, he says, thank you, you're in there, it's great to connect with you. Containment in New Rochelle, but no one has actually prevented from coming or leaving, so don't know what that means. There's a drive through test center. Jamie wants to ask a dumb question. Why is it that we're not just having those who are at high risk of fatality quarantine and dedicating resources to those populations in particular? I'm sure there's an obvious explanation to this, but I don't totally know. Um, well, you know, Jamie, in part that is happening. I think while there are no US cities or states that I know of that are gone on total lockdown in the way that Italy has or Wuhan and, and the Hubei region did, the places that are on lockdown are nursing homes and senior centers. Uh, I just spoke with a friend yesterday who's got family in Illinois, two grandparents, a uh, couple that's married. One is in an intensive part of the senior care with a lot of more hands-on and the other is in the more independent living. So like the assisted side and the independent living side. And there's now a wall between them. Uh, literally, they kind of barred in a contact between assisted and independent. And they've greatly limited visitation. And I know uh, the governor of Washington State did a similar thing where it's like one at a time um, and hospitals are starting to limit. I have another friend who is due to give birth any day now and her doula might not even be able to show up in the hospital. Um, her husband might not be allowed to show up because they wanna limit the number of people who come in and then could infect a medical worker. And if one of those workers gets taken out, that has a, you know, a highly leveraged impact on the system versus somebody just being sick at home uh, because they need to be in contact with other people so they could spread it or they're not able to help and heal people. So it's like a triple, it's a multiplier effect in the negative uh, when those, if anyone else has information to answer Jamie's question about the degree to which um, we're quarantining and social distancing amongst just the, the vulnerable. My last somewhat educated guess is that you know, it's kind of this Kevin Bacon six degrees sort of thing where we, um, the chain of uh, spread is such that to just ask the elderly to socially distance themselves wouldn't come near enough to actually slow the spread of the virus. Uh, like young healthy people running around and acting a fool and partying like they did in that Nashville video. For anybody who didn't see that, there's a big old party last night in Nashville, like defiantly um putting themselves at risk that will connect to like a cab driver who will connect to a school teacher or a bus driver or a bank clerk or you know someone who ends up at that senior home and so it's about the the chain of distribution so the propagation and so the smartest thing is for everybody including and maybe even especially the healthy because the healthier are way more mobile than the infirm uh the young like to hit the clubs. I My whole life was about living on planes and popping into large crowds. And even coming back from New York last week, 
I was like, oh my, I have to get on a plane, but I'm starting to do mental contact tracing. I'm like, how many people is that TA, TSA agent handling? How many people did this driver deal with? You know, like all this air and the, the, the cabin, and where does everybody who landed go? So it's, um, it's, it's, I think that's the answer. Maybe there's some other takes of intelligent nature happening in the chat. So uh, I hope that that is true. I know the Washington Post also has a graphic um, about that sort of dramatically paints a picture of what the social distancing looks like when you apply it, uh, how it affects the, uh, the spread of the virus with and without social distancing. And, uh, oh, good, I have just found it. So this is where I'm gonna share the screen, getting all kinds of buzzing. And then I'll go back to y'all to see, I'm just gonna do the browser this time, share. Okay, so y'all are seeing what I see. This is my Twitter feed. And actually, that's I'm gonna take y'all through my feed a little bit too. Oh, Barstool, okay, cool. Um, let's just play this video. Henry Stevens of the Washington Post posted it. So let's see if I can. If you like bouncing balls explaining how to slow down coronavirus, this is a correct answer, Jamie. My latest story in the Washington Post is for you. An outbreak like coronavirus spread exponentially, how to flatten the curve. So let's take a look. Uh, also, I am a paying member of the Washington Post because it's my original hometown newspaper. Uh, okay, so after, the, I'm just gonna kind of read along with you because I haven't seen this before. After the first case of COVID-19, the disease caused by the new strain was announced in the US, reports of further infections trickled in two months later. So this is basically like, an image of what exponential growth looks like. And I think, again, I'm gonna pause because psychologically, we're not trained for that as human beings. Um, we have a very like linear kind of geometric growth, maybe mindset, but we don't expect tomorrow to look radically different from today. And I think what you've got to anticipate, what we've all got to brace ourselves for is that you know, we joke about it in the age of Trump, like every week feels like a year, but in exponential math, every week is a year in like a data perspective. Um, and so the jump from like, you know, March 3rd from 122 to March 13th, 2179, that's not steady as, as, it, as it goes. So they're explaining what exponential curves are. I like that. Um, and without any measures to slow it down, like social distancing, it will continue to spread exponentially for months, that's real. Um, so we will call our fake disease <laughs> simulitis because it's from a simulation, get it? It spreads even more easily. Let me just um, make this a little smaller for those of you on a phone that might help. Um, we'll call our fake disease simulitis. It spreads even more easily than COVID-19. So whenever a healthy person, which is a green dot, comes into contact with a sick person, this kind of brownish dot, the healthy person becomes sick too. So I'm gonna play this and you see, oh look, it's like the chain of infection because visualize, great. I'm so happy to know when I'm not slinging bullshit. All right, so in a population of just five people, it doesn't take long for pretty much everyone to catch uh, simulitis. Now in real life, of course, people recover. So a recovered person can neither transmit it to a healthy person nor become sick again. So they've kind of got that simulation. The first person's recovered, the second person's recovered. And so that bounce back doesn't kind of reinfect them. That population is, is contaminated, but unable at a certain point, you know, if they're not contacting uninfected people to spread it further. School matters, y'all. <laughs> I just wanna I just wanna point that out. Um, yeah, healthy young people can pass along, you know, the infection of vulnerable people. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. So let's see what happens when simulitis spreads in a town of 200 people. And thank you to whoever drew on my screen. We will start everyone in town at a random position, moving at, at a random angle, and we will make one person sick. And you can kind of see, and they plotted it, the, the chart of kind of cumulative sick people. And you see how fast the town is done, right? And like time increments of what? And then people are recovering. 
So they chose a town the size of Whittier, Alaska, 200 people. So it was able to spread quickly across the entire population. And that whole population is infected, recovered, and can't get reinfected, which in the absence of a vaccine, it feels like how you sort of quote unquote beat this thing or, or at least get through it. Um, what the art author is saying in this article, in a country like the US though, with 330 million people, the curve would steepen for a long time before it started to slow. And when it comes to the real COVID-19, we would prefer to slow the spread of the virus before it infects a large portion of the US population. To slow stimulitis, we've created a, a forced quarantine such that, uh, <laughs> I'm multitasking y'all. So, um, but I just got a, a message, Ross Martin, thank you. Can I just say this is better than the democratic debate that I'm watching right now? Um, and he already read this article. So thank you, they, they already read this, Ross. Um, but back to my reading. So essentially, they're plotting a simulation coming up, I'll scroll and activate it. But what's gonna happen in this is that they're trying to slow the spread that they showed us above by creating a forced quarantine on a certain part of the population, such as what China did in the Hubei province. And so we see how that goes. Um, quarantine on the left, open population on the right. And this curve is flattened. And when people are talking about flattening the curve, that's what they mean. You don't want this thing to arch real high. You want to kind of smooth it out. It's like in driving lessons when you're, you know, accelerating off of a stop or like approaching a stop sign, you don't slam on the accelerator, you don't slam on the brakes, you can overwhelm um, your passengers, you know, especially if it's a driving instructor who doesn't really appreciate that. You have to, have to do the class again because uh, you're so heavy footed. That didn't happen to me. I'm just saying like some people out there might totally identify with that kind of, um, you know, analogy. So uh, the rest of the story, many people work in the city, live in the neighborhood where people will be separated from their families. Um, some people will still go out. Let's see what happens when a quarter of our population continues to move around while the other three quarters adopt a strategy of what health experts call social distancing. So if you keep the dots still, right? Hey, Baratunde, don't maybe fly around the country talking to thousands of people at a time, right? Which is totally stopped, by the way. Um, but it, you, you, again, you flatten that curve. More social distancing keeps even more people healthy and people can be nudged away from public places by removing the alert. For example, by closing <laughs> as many responsible churches bars, restaurants, retail outlets, um, and, and, and conferences and gatherings have started to do. We control the desire, desire to be in public spaces by close. It's like I wrote this article, y'all, <laughs> by closing down public spaces, Italy's closing its restaurants, China's closing everything, um, and we're closing things now too. And then they're simulating even more social distance. But I think y'all get the idea, so I'm, I'm not going to continue. Um, but that's why, uh, Jane, we don't just focus on quarantining the sick, uh, because we all potentially can be the sick and we're interconnected as much as we feel like uh, selfishly uh, separate from each other. If there's any proof that we're all interconnected, a virus is here to remind us that we're, we're like actually one people. Uh, so, you know, spiritually folks have been saying that, quantum physicists have been saying it, and now the epidemiologists are reminding us uh, as well. Uh, and, and the if it's not been obvious, because I don't know how much information people have been consuming and I've been doing maybe too much, you, the reason you flatten the curve isn't just for the sake of it, it's because our society and our health infrastructure is designed to withstand a certain amount of pressure, right? And so when I'm talking about punching the accelerator or slamming on the brakes, like your passengers, they don't appreciate that and they, some of them can't handle it, right? You get nauseous, you throw up and I think, our hospitals don't appreciate that. Uh, and in the literal sense, they cannot handle it. And so what's, what David shared with us is that's happening in, in Italy, we, uh, you know, people who need to go to the ER because they have to deliver a baby, or maybe they broke their leg, rock climbing or any old thing, uh, that system is gonna be overwhelmed by all these cases that we could have spread out and given the system a chance to adapt. Our testing can't keep up. Our, our treatment, our, you know, testing, diagnosis, treatment, um, not just of COVID-19 cases, but of everything else the medical system is supposed to 
accommodate. And that's how systems break down. Uh, it starts because of one case, but if hospitals can't serve anybody, then that has a ripple effect to everyone who's sick for other reasons or injured for other reasons. And so people who might not have died would die. And we saw it in Puerto Rico with the hurricane. And when this argument about how many people died in, in due to Hurricane Maria, uh, well, what do you count as a hurricane death? Was it somebody who got hit by a flying piece of debris? Was it someone who drowned due to the rising waters? Was it someone who couldn't re-up on their asthma medication or other prescription because they couldn't physically reach the hospital? You know, if you have an underlying health condition and this impact to the health system prevents you from accessing the care you would under a normal scenario, then you're a victim of this disaster, just kind of a second order, but you still count. Uh, so that's what we're, uh, what we have to look forward to in some ways. All right, I'm gonna check the chat and I think I should probably start to wind this down, but I wanna check your temperature, everybody. Uh, I also wanna make sure this thing doesn't just drop on me okay so we got ronald has posted i'm in miami and the tv showed hundreds of spring breakers who were packed into the clubs last night and then again today on south beach most of the young folk interviewed were annoyed by the potential interruption of their break and their activities all i kept thinking is that these kids are headed home to their families spreading the virus here here um okay so let me return to anything I had prepared to share with y'all. Um, Nashville people were being dumb, sounded like Miami people. I don't need to show you that. <laughs> and then there was there was this Tom Fullery. Um, maybe one more screen share browser. I think the browser is better than playing with the iPad. Show how many devices I got. Uh, this is a, a TikTok video the coronavirus challenge, right? You see that? That's so disgusting, so disgusting. So yeah, we don't need that, right? I think nobody, and even on a good day, right? Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna for the sake of argument, define a good day as not a pandemic happening, right? So on a really good day with um, like positive news in the world, you still don't want to be licking a toilet seat on an airplane, y'all, come on now. That's ridiculous. Yes, yes, okay. All right, thank you um, 26 Podcast for joining. Thank you everyone for joining. I'll kind of open it up if there's anything that you want to see or hear. Um, Chime in. Mm, no temperature checks at the airports. Yeah, I confirmed another friend of mine told me uh, no temperature checks at the airports, no gloves by customs officers, no um, hand sanitizer either. And, you know, I think what happened, this is, is gonna be bad. I just hate to say that, it's gonna be bad. I will continue to be positive, not necessarily blindly hopeful, but I think this is where leadership matters. And with our president, you know, he likes to make these snap decisions and then not plan for the aftermath of it, like the kids in cages situation. We got another one of those where he like, instantly shuts down travel, forcing everybody to fly back home. There's no preparation to receive them. So now you got people coming back from more infected areas who are packed tightly at custom. And nobody's getting a temperature check and nobody's got hand sanitizer and these border agents are touching everybody, stamping, you know, like, and then we're unleashing them back into the country. So on the surface, like the story was, we got to, keep those filthy Europeans out of clean America. And instead what you've just done is injected the virus right into the heart of America. Um, and I think, you know, for a party that talks tough game on immigration yeah. and, uh, and criticizes open borders, they're very open borders when it comes to viruses. 
very open borders. All right, somebody's microphone is on. Does that mean you're trying to say something? I'm cool if you are. If not, um, mute yourself before you. I'm still looking for a check yourself before you wreck yourself that works in these video conferencing times. Mute yourself before you flute yourself. Silence yourself before you violence yourself. That's the closest. Silence yourself before you violence yourself. <laughs> so stupid. Thank you for this. Is like a private comedy show uh, slash news briefing uh, <laughs> on a Sunday. Um, iPhone Martha, do you have something to say, or are you just accidentally not muted? No, I blew it. <laughs> That's, we need this. That was the technical glitch we've been waiting for because you just made me belly laugh. Because this show is called Live on Lockdown, aka LOL. This is a very, very test episode. Um, thank you. I'm going to check the chat, see what else. I have also uh, Kristen Neinhuis. Neinhuis, German, Dutch. I have the family in Shanghai, and they are coming out on the other side after nearly two months of quarantine. Yeah, so I'm very curious to see what China's story is. Like this whole viral thing, <laughs> to play it down, this whole viral thing, uh, this global pandemic situation is an exercise in time travel. Because what you've got happening is we're all relatively similar human beings. Some populations are older, some like in Wuhan smoke more or exposed to more like weaker lungs. So they might have a different reaction. In America, it might be our obesity that puts us, you know, in the hot seat. But you're getting these waves of experiences and these curves are the same. They're just shifted in time. So if you want to see our future, you look to Italy. Um, and maybe you look to China to see beyond. And so what they do and how they respond, how their system reacts to coming down the backside of that curve, uh, to going back to work, you know, to reopening factories and movie theaters and restaurants and music festivals, what's that going to be like for the Chinese? And how long will it take all of the rest of us to literally get over this hump? Um, and how much life are we going to lose? How many businesses are not going to make it to the other side? Uh, how many, you know, I expect a ton of bankruptcies to come out of this because who's got that much cash on hand to weather that kind of storm? Like, we are not that nation. You know, we are the just in time, can barely afford a $400 medical expense nation. And so all those chickens are coming home to roost uh, as well. So that's, that's sad. Uh, Oh, Dutch, yes, yes, okay, good, I guess right. Um, I wonder if, do you think millennials are just saying, hey, let's call the herd? <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure some incompassionate millennials would say that out loud and not even like the Gen Zers you know, coming behind them. I was like, is this a karmic? you know, uh, comeuppance for an older generation that left this younger generation with a decaying planet and, you know, financial imbalance. Uh, but that's you know, really not how these things work. Uh, but there can still be jokes. So yeah, all right, then given that, let me just check my show notes and see if there's, yeah, there is one more segment. I'm so glad I did, because I wanna share some resources. So here's what we're going to do. We're gonna go back to the browser, booyah. And actually I'm gonna do a couple things. So one is I have, y'all have all seen, if you read to the bottom of my emails, and if you haven't, this is a personal service to bump it to the top. Uh, the way I kind of navigate information, I'll give you a little behind the scenes. And this is like my Twitter feed, which I don't tweet as much as I used to, but I do consume still a fair amount. And so I built a list of, trustworthy sources. It's just 11 members on the list, so very low volume, um, spearheaded by Laurie Garrett, who is you know, this former senior fellow at the Center for Foreign Relations. She got a Pulitzer Prize, two polks and a Peabody. It's like a Christmas song. Two polks and a Peabody. Um, 
anyway, she's a dope science journalist and she recommended a number of the people who are on this list. So I like to flip through that feed and, you know, she's talking about the debate. So I don't want to spoil that. Uh, some, you know, Marie Leconte, I can't stop thinking about the unspoken victims of social distancing, the horrible teens who've just discovered passion and alcohol pops and now need to spend a month locked indoors with their parents. Um, also, the amount of server load on Fortnite, this is going to be a real test uh, on that. Yeah, so uh, so I look at that list. I have another list, um, and both of these you can find. I'm subscribed to. I did not create this. I can't take credit for it. Uh, Kristen Dorgello created. It's uh, much larger. There's 90 members in that list, and it's way more global. My list is very U.S.-centric and driven by science writers or scientists. Hers has representatives of those populations, but all around the world. So I get a much broader sense uh, of that. And I came here to show you uh, something, which was resources. So we went through the That's Stupid. I, that's my smart feeds. Uh, those of you in the LA area, and I think many cities are doing things like this, uh, LA schools are closed effective tomorrow, but students who depend on meals from those schools can still be fed at the Dream Center uh, in Bellevue, Bellevue Ave in LA, 90026. And this is all kind of Googleable stuff. So I'm not saying like, Everybody watching this stream should go to the Dream Center in LA. Like, do not get on a plane and fly to LA for the free food, but keep your ears out and check the fees from your cities for what they might be doing to help the vulnerable uh, in this situation. And the Brooklyn Public Library, this is accessible to everyone. Uh, I'm very excited about this. I'm on the board of the Brooklyn Public Library, uh, though I now am an Angelino. I that's a recent shift, and I maintain my responsibilities there. So they do this thing called virtual story time. And the, the library has remained open in Brooklyn but with limited hours and a lot more aggressive cleaning. And they've canceled all the programs, which is a lot of the reason people go to the library. Uh, but if you're homeless and you use the library for information, I think they felt a responsibility to keep that resource open. At any rate, uh, this kid story time stuff, they've got going. And uh, tomorrow, Monday, these are I think Eastern times, 11 to 11.30 a.m., uh, Tuesday to the 2.30 p.m. Anybody in the world, it's on Facebook Live, so Zuckerberg's paying the server bill. Uh, so regardless of where you are, if you're out there with kids and uh, you're, they're driving you nuts uh, because you're tired of reading the same book over and over again, let a librarian read a book for half an hour to them and, and take a load off. Put your... Um, Facebook live stream up on the family TV, on a big iPad, whatever you got, and, uh, and do that. So that's a resource. And then last but not least, uh, for now in resources, many of you are here through community, the text message service. There is a doctor on community who's answering COVID-19 questions, Dr. David Agus, or Agus, not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, that number is 310-299-9322. You text that number. Um, you can subscribe to his channel. You don't have to do all the same info sharing you did for me because it's the same back end. So your name and your location and your gender pronoun and all, like that's done. So once you're in community, you're in community. I just gave that company a tagline. Roll with that, Molly. Um, okay, that's my resources. I already did the let's bring you in. We kind of sprinkled that throughout, which I like more. And notes from viewers. Some of y'all uh, took my, um, to advice or request to listen and added some questions or our ideas. So Jamie says, can you please share a high level instruction guide for hosting one of these? I'd like to do something similar to support our small business. We happen to have Zoom already. Humble brag. Uh, so we stopped to share. So what did I do here? Well, you saw me kind of learn through it, but I, um, I have Zoom Pro. I sit in the settings with no password, muting the, the, the um, audio and video of participants by default. And I'm running on a Logitech HD 1080p camera uh, with a little lens cap cover built in because people be spying. And uh, I'm just using the AirPods for my audio, but I do have a proper sure mic that i'll patch in through anyway we're getting real technical my audio quality will get higher 
I also have some studio lighting, which I didn't feel like I needed because of the diffuse daylight. Uh, and as you can see, you know, I'm experimenting with like the agenda and sharing that and with checking in with the chat. Um, another thing I did Friday was a, a virtual happy hour, virtual whiskey Friday with like nine other friends. And in that sense, I use gallery view. So I'm gonna put y'all on gallery view now. Most of you have um, hidden your video, but I'm gonna request and you don't have to accept. I'm just gonna ask everyone to start sharing video if you we wanna see your faces because it's a good way to close. Um, and let's see here. Good, it's happening, it's happening. Um, and I've still got everybody muted because that'll be a little chaotic. <laughs> But I, I will um, also go ahead and uh, and unmute folks. Yes, we have 12 people in a grid. So, oh my goodness, is that Cousin Tanya? <laughs> What's up, fam? We have literal family in the house. That is ridiculous. This is beautiful. So uh, to risk chaos, I'm unmuting everybody. I want to hear your beautiful voices. Hear your voices. Your faces, and in some cases, I'll hear my own voice because there's an echo effect. Hear my own voice because there's an echo effect. Well done. Well done. Yeah, Burton, this is great. Thank you. Yeah, Burton, this is great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, I just have to screenshot that. This is like. This is America, well right? Well like, the other side of uh, Donald Glover's yeah, song. That, that, that too was America. Right? We, we are, America. this is a beautiful, look at these faces. <laughs> we got facial hair, no facial hair. We got look all the shades. We got terrible lighting. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you everyone. If, if anyone wants to say something, now is the time. Otherwise I'm not going to wind it down. Hey, Barry, today. This is Ross. I'll just comment that uh, my, my uh, comment about the millennials, you know, uh, her, calling the herd was not about the her fact. Calling the herd was not about the fact. The reaction to it has been, um, in some ways, you know, they they have not been taking the uh, social. Uh, social restrictions very, very seriously. And I wonder if you think that that's, uh, that there may be an element that people are just saying, you know, I'm, I'm kind of done with these folks who screwed my life over so badly. Yeah, yeah, I, um, like they, they would not be entirely unjustified if those were emotions that they possessed. How about that for like a real soft, soft peddling uh, on, on that one um, because you kind of look at what hand uh, our entire generation has been dealt and it's, it's just not good and, and a lot of them have been saying like get your shit together old folks and people want to just be like nah we're going to pass the buck you know kind of literally so yeah it makes it makes perfect sense thanks for uh, sharing that reasonable yet sad perspective on uh, intergenerational tension. Anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna take that silence as a cue. I'm gonna look at the glance at the chat one last time. Uh, your thoughts on colleges to effectively finish out the semester online? Tanya, yes. I, uh, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be weird. I'm super articulate, and the best I can come up with is weird. But my, I, I'll, instead of overthinking, I'll tell you what. Like my gut was World War II, and there are a lot of you know. I worked the reunions for Harvard. I graduated in '99, and so you got people coming back to college in the late '90s who graduated from five years ago to like 60 years ago. So you got like some World War II type people in the mix is actually 70, 75 years ago for some. And the, the nature of those college reunions is just different. A lot of their friends were dead. Um, Sometimes they had to like combine reunions because the integrity of their class year didn't hold. Because folks, you know, you may have entered as a class of uh, 45, but you didn't actually graduate till 51. 
uh, because you had to serve or because it took you longer to come up with funds to pay for it because the GI Bill was difficult or you know things like that. So I think we could anticipate a blip, right, in sort of the, the pattern like that where you're just, you're gonna have a group for a year or two, hopefully not more than that, that has a really abnormal experience relative to their counterparts on either end. They don't have the commencement speaker, right? Their parents don't get to pick them up and move out. You don't toss your hat into the air. All these things that we have been culturally um, taught mean college won't exist for a group of people. And they'll get the degrees, most of them, and they'll get the paper and they'll get jobs and all that kind of stuff. But I think the cohesion, the physical cohesion, uh, that's like the downside. On the positive end, like, yo, they're going to have a hell of a story. And, you know, I thought my class 1999 was the dopest because Prince wrote a song about us, right? We're going to party like it's 1999. But if you're the class of 2020, like, you're the pandemic. You're the survivors of a global pandemic. So you got all kinds of bragging rights for like the rest of your life. So if I was trying to look for the silver lining in this, that's what I would, uh, I would, I would think. Uh, okay, well, thank you uh, all for joining in. Very short notice. I appreciate you letting me test my tech on you. I'm gonna eat some quick food. Quick question. Oh, quick question. So yes. sorry, I was about to type it. I didn't want you to end before I finished typing it. How do people join your thread? I just shared a screenshot of this and how amazing it was and people are asking. Can you put that in your doc? Uh, so here's what's going to happen. I'm actually very glad you asked, Jamie. Um, I had intended to make this stream very public, but that requires um, to, was it Ross's question? Uh, it required more technical uh, time than I had to set this up. So this is a private event. I am recording it, and I may, if I can find the time, edit this down it's like over an hour and it's mostly me playing with my ipad which isn't the best content in the world so if i get my act together i'll try to cut a version of this down uh, especially when we're going through the washington post and like hearing from david in italy and like this grid thing those are beautiful moments and i'll throw that up on all the socials the instagram etc in the future i'm likely to stream it and you can share the google drive link with her i will also text out um to you <laughs> uh, and anybody who i can see has like joined in the doc link i don't want to spam my whole text but i'm thinking out loud my newsletter is coming out tuesday so i will drop a link in that newsletter to the google doc which will remain open and to whatever edited version of this video uh exists if not before then and i'll think through other ways to make this more public in the future i'm likely to like have a core audience that i can interact with here but then pump this out to Twitch TV, which is a very public link and you don't have to install software and everybody in the world can at least witness that. Uh, does that make sense? Any other ideas on that? I'm totally open to it. I haven't like run it. It does, but more than this specific one, I was actually, I meant you in general. Is it just the 202 number that you text oh. us from that they need to text? Oh yeah, that, that number, you wanna know what the number? Yeah, how what do they get access again? to you? You texted us tonight about joining this and with all yeah. sorts of other amazing yeah. relevant updates that my community wants in on, right. what do okay. I tell them to do? Oh yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> I just gave a whole treatise on freaking Zoom and Twitch. Uh, yeah, just have them text me. The number I text you from, it's, it's an open number, 202-894-8844. And they'll have to opt in and accept all that stuff. But <laughs> this is this is great. This is great. I'm learning. Sometimes it's simpler than I think. Uh, I just pass her the phone number. Okay. Last call for alcohol or comments or questions. Anybody else speak now? I see silence. I see muted. Cheers. If there's someone talking, I can't hear you right now. So I'm just on one last check. Cheers. Cheers, Ross. Cheers. I got a, a bowl of rice I can toast you with. Uh, there's no liquid in this, in this room. Um, this has been really fun. 
I'm I'm kind of exhausted. Now I'm going to go watch two old men argue over who among them should replace the other old man who's our president. Uh, no offense to old men. Some of my best friends are old men. Uh, this has been Live on Lockdown, a semi-secret test show. I appreciate all of you. And I'll let you know when I'm doing it again, clearly. Bye, y'all. Okay, stopping the recording.